I'm Guido Appenzeller, CEO of Big Switch Networks. Uh, we just talked about Big Tap, you know, which is a, a product, it's GA. Uh, we're starting start to see some very large scale deployments you know, across many data centers, very exciting. Um, I want to talk about a second product, uh, which is called, uh, which the whole stack is essentially cloud fabric, right? And it's pieced together from Big Virtual Switch, which is the application running on top of our controller platform. And uh, you know, that uh, then in conjunction with Switch Lite switches. I think Kyle mentioned it for, for Big Tap. We were working either with uh, switches from partners that have SDN protocols implemented. We have a compatibility list there. Or alternatively with, uh, you know, with bare metal switches. For BVS, we're actually only working with bare metal switches because we're willing to squeeze out the last bit of performance from these chips. And, and we can't do that uh, you know, with the standardized protocols today. So the problem that BVS solves essentially is, is network virtualization, right? So uh, the, the solution, it's, it's a fabric, right, that, that powers your data center. Big Tap is an overlay network, right, for a very specific purpose. This is actually the main network, right, that carries your data traffic, right? So this replaces your main network. The fabric has the capability to virtualize the network. And, uh, you know, when we talk about network virtualization, there's sort of two competing um, approaches out there. You know, the first one, uh, you might have heard a lot about this uh, when VMworld happened uh, you know, um, recently. The basic idea is we, we take the hypervisor switches, create a full mesh of tunnels between the hypervisor switches, and all the logic happens in, the, in, the, in these hypervisor switches. The network behind that, so to speak, is a dumb network, right? You simply tunnel over it. You don't need to modify it, but all the logic is, is moved down to the hypervisor. The second model is where you actually say, well, we can control both the switches, the physical switches, as well as the hypervisor switches. In this case, you can still tunnel if you want to, but alternatively, you can also simply forward the packets hop by hop and, and, and switch them hop by hop. Right? Um, both approaches are out there. You know, in the past, we pretty much didn't have a choice. We had to go with the overlay solution just because the, the physical switches did not have the necessary capabilities. So if you're using OpenFlow 1.0, the physical switches has a couple of thousand entries. You know, we can't run a data center uh, you know, on an architecture like that. Um, now that we basically can fully leverage the power of these chips and these bare metal switches, for us, we made a decision to go 100% on the right-hand side. So you know, and earlier this year, if you look at our product, it supported overlays. Going forward, we no longer support overlays. Right? We're, we're, everything is, is directly switched. Um, you know, it has a couple of advantages specifically for the integration of uh, any kind of physical endpoints. You don't need any tunnels you know, to integrate these endpoints, but you can basically just plug them in directly, uh, and they will work. So, this is sort of the overall solution. Um, we have, you know, imagine you have a data center, you have racks of servers, you have top of rack switches, we have, you know, sort of a leaf spine architecture. Uh, top of rack switches are bare metal switches with switch light, spine switches are bare metal switches with switch light. You know, we have a compatibility list um, that you can pick a switch from. We have hypervisor switches on the virtualized hosts, right? These are, this is switch light for Linux, basically a hypervisor switch. And then you can also plug in bare metal servers. You know, for some applications like a database server, you know, some of our customers, they don't like virtualizing for performance reasons. And last but not least, you can plug in services. So if you, for example, have a physical firewall or a physical load balancer, you can plug them directly you know, into this fabric as well. And we can then stitch them um, into the overall solution. You can deploy this, this fabric basically pod by pod. Right? So you don't have to swap it out in your entire data center. What we're seeing customers do more and more is if they plan, for example, a small private cloud in their data center that they basically decide to buy the servers and the switches together as one unit. Right? And if you're buying new, new network equipment uh, anyways, then why not use very cost effective and you know, very, very low OPEX um, uh, uh, you know, bare metal switches. The whole solution plugs into OpenStack. So the orchestration, you know, for example, creating virtual layer two domains, creating you know, your layer three routing, inserting services, right? creating application templates. We'll see all of that in the demo. That all you know, is, is done together with OpenStack, in many cases driven through the OpenStack stack UI. Right? So the goal here is really to, to make a big step forward towards self-service, that people can set up you know, a, a fairly complex network with a very small amount of time or, or even fully uh, automatically. From 30,000 feet, does that make sense so far? Yep. I think it's, the no overlay thing is a bit of a, 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 bit of a surprise to me, right? Yeah. I wasn't, wasn't expecting that, but it, at the end of the day, that, as I said before about carving a flow, you're, you don't need the overlay because you can carve the entire end-to-end -end network. So, 
Yeah, it's a great question and uh, a great opportunity to probably rat hole into a, a religious debate for you know for, for the next half hour, which I'm, I'm trying to avoid here. But uh, you know, when when we started deploying this with customers, I mean, we found that if you have one rack or two racks, you know, creating creating an overlay works great. Right? For piloting, it, it's fantastic. Right? As you scale this out, and, and you can do it without asking the networking team. That's often the best feature. Right? You have the server guys like, well, we don't need to talk to the networking guys. Right? We can just just do this ourselves. Um, as you scale this out, right, you say, like, okay, now let's do 16 racks. Right? Uh, at some point, you have to talk to the networking guys, and then things get complicated, right? Because like, okay, so we now have two management consoles, you know, uh, two panes of glass, one for the physical network, one for the virtual network. Is that, is that really what you want, right? How do these work together? I mean, our goal here is really to, to find a solution that empowers you know, uh, the, the network operators to have one network that, that stretches down um, you know, into the hypervisors so that you can run through one pane of glass, you know, one, one uh, system of administration and, and not, sort of not a, not a split brain. So for, for a lot of the bigger web 2.0 shops, so they're doing layer three top of rack, right? Yeah. So this solution offering becomes a little more... It, Sorry, it comes a little? It, it becomes a little hard to, to pitch this particular solution offering in a top of rack layer three solution, right? In terms of, it's not my experience, but why? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily see. I mean, from an API uh, basis for like load balance and firewall service offerings, right? You're going to have different discrete teams that are managing those service offerings. Often, um, if they're not all on board for doing this particular design, how are you going to stitch all that together? So that's a fair question, right? If you have a very compartmentalized infrastructure team, right? Can can you make them actually talk to each other? Is it better to go with separate solutions? I mean. I think that the trend we're seeing is that these teams are, are if anything, you know, merging, right? I mean, we, we have customers now that basically, not quite on one purchase order, but almost on one purchase order, basically have the entire system, everything included, right? Where you right, say, rack, rack and roll or, or, no, it's, it's, or it's the, the or racks, the, the, Yeah, exactly, right? The racks, the controls, the switches, the storage, right? All in one piece, right? And, and the services. I, I still have a lot of customers that are very, very siloed, so I see challenges in terms of... I, I completely hear you. I mean, th this is the enterprise, right? Um, uh, things in the enterprise never disappear, right? right. Once they're there, they, they last forever. Um, I think we're looking here at a, a sort of... At a, the early adopters for this are, are customers sort of building private clouds, right? And this is sort of, it's a very, it's a very specific set of customers. But you know what we've seen is that this model with them resonates. All right, and much, yep. without further ado, uh, Rob, let's do the demo. All right, uh, I, I'm really glad that you brought up, uh, you know, service uh, stitching, service integration, because that's what I'm going to demo. <laughs> so uh, specifically. You know, uh, there are a lot of things you can do with a fabric. Uh, people do lots of things with fabrics. Uh, somewhat surprising to me, at least, you know, almost everybody we talk to, the thing that they are having the biggest problem with is deploying kind of multi-tier complicated web apps. So if you take, you know, for example, kind of a, a canonical three-tier web app, what does this look like? So you've got some traffic coming from the internet that needs to go to a load balancer. Uh, that gets sprayed out to a bunch of your, your web tier services. So these are compute nodes. Uh, and these do some web processing, but there's ultimately some back-end data processing that you need to do, and that gets spit out to an application tier, which is not allowed to talk to the internet, but maybe has a load balancer between it. And that typically has some back-end data, and I, I'm showing this with three tiers because that's you know, how I typically see it, but usually at the bottom tier, wherever that is, there's a, a cluster of databases, and maybe these are physical servers because they're really performance sensitive. And you know, I've shown this only here with load balancers, but there's, all, there's firewalls involved in this. People have separate debugging networks. The security policies for how these things connect and, and mash together, this is, in my mind, the problem, right? It's just a pain in the ass to put together. Yeah. Um, and this is exactly the thing that, that, that you were raising. And you know, the, the, the quote that I've heard from a, a couple customers now is, after an application has been written, tested, and QA'd, it takes them five to nine months to deploy in the network just for the network configuration in terms of finding the, you know, the the, the, the outage windows and, and setting all the configs right and talking to the right people and talking to the right teams and all these things. And there's even the whole issue of just compliance, of keeping it within that environment, yes. especially if they have particular requirements within your particular yep. area. Of, is deploying of this thing going to break the things I've already deployed? Right. Right. Um, so this is a mess. Uh, it actually gets worse with VMs because VMs can move around. And so a lot of our, our policy tuning knobs you know, in, in the industry, not, not in Big Switch, are physically coupled, meaning that if you want a firewall to block traffic between A and B, you actually have to put it on the wire that goes between A and B. Uh, if you want to assign an ACL to something, you typically assign it to a port. So if it moves around, you have to move the ACL around. And then that's, that's a pain. 
And so, um, you know, we have kind of this vision of what, what we're calling an, an application profile, which is a, a notion of each tier is a fungible chunk of compute resources, physical or virtual. And you have policies between tiers. And those policies can be, you know, tier X is allowed to talk to tier Y, tier X is only allowed to talk to tier Y by going through this firewall, or a pool of firewalls, or a pool of load balancers. Um, you know, you can imagine a chain of these things. X is allowed to talk to Y if it only goes through the load balancer, then the firewall, then the NAT service, or, or something like that. And you can kind of chain these things together arbitrarily. Um, the, the critical thing that I, I think we're, that we believe, and I, I believe it's true, is working with these things at a logical level, meaning at, at this level picture, it's just fundamentally easier to understand for, for mere mortals than it is at the physical level of which ports are involved. Um, and so the, the demo that I'm going to show you uh, is uh, using OpenStack. Um, you know, people were saying it takes months to do this. In, in minutes, uh, I'm actually going to pop up three different web tiers with a bunch of VMs in them. Uh, and I'm going to isolate them by the following security policy. So the internet can reach the web tier, but not the, the app and the DB tiers. Um, and the web tier can't talk to the DB tier. This is kind of the most typical configuration that I've seen. Um, so that's my first trick. And the second trick is we're going to throw in some load balancers there. Uh, for folks who don't see it, uh, we've got uh, an F5 box in the rack here. Um, you know, we, we're actually vendor agnostic in terms of this. Uh, that said, uh, for configuration purposes, uh, we're working with uh, OpenStack and a bunch of people to make a kind of roughly vendor agnostic uh, API to these things. So right now, the, the demo I'm going to show you, the, uh, the load balancer parts of these are hand configured. Uh, but that's not inherent to, to this. You know, we can imagine you know, uh, standards coming out for, for managing these APIs, at least at a high level. You'll always have to go under the covers for, for any sort of fancy bits. Um, and the last bit is, you know, how do you debug this? You know, anytime you start talking about a logical topology versus a physical one, it's just a big mess. Uh, you start getting to you know, hard to answer questions like, uh, what role did this packet hit? Like, why did it do the thing that it did? Uh, what path did it take through the network? Uh, and so we've got a, a fun command uh, called test packet that, that will show you all, all of this information pulled dynamically from the network so you don't have to do it by hand. So um, this is the logical topology. Uh, the physical topology um, built into this one rack is um, this is a physical server. This is a physical server. Uh, we've got an OpenStack controller. Uh, we've got two compute nodes. Uh, we've got the F5 load balancer, and you know, this laptop is on the external network. Uh, and I'm going to drop in uh, a bunch of VMs. So what I'm actually going to do for the sake of demo magic is I'm going to pop up Oh, uh, sorry. Had to log me out. All right. I'm going to pop up the nice graphical view of this uh, while my colleague John in the background is actually going to type the OpenStack commands. And you guys have probably all seen OpenStack. Uh, he's going to pull up uh, these things on the fly for us while it refreshes, and I'll, I'll walk through what's going on. It, it turns out that typing and clicking and whatnot uh, while talking is a bit hard. Uh, not to mention the fact that we're not really demoing OpenStack here. We're, we're, we're demoing what we can do with OpenStack on top of that. So uh, what John's popped up here is uh, three different networks. Number three is coming any minute now. Um, so John's assigned the IP addresses, and he said that these are L2 domains. You know, th this is, you know, from an OpenStack, you have the concept of an isolation domain. Right now, any VMs that we were to bring up on these things can't talk to each other because there's no path yet. Now, the next thing that John's going to do is bring up a, a logical router. And he's done that. And he's going to add a, what's the logical equivalent of an interface to each of these L2 domains. Now, the critical thing about the logical router, and this is something that our controller implements, is that it's actually local. It's effectively local to each vSwitch. So that, you know, there's a dot one address that corresponds to each interface. And that interface exists everywhere in the network that these VMs do. And so if you go through the router from you know, the web tier to the app tier, if two VMs are local to each other, it never leaves that vSwitch. Right? So we have the logical view, which is this, but then the physical view is always shortest path. Now that you mention all this, where do you handle ARPs? Say again? Where do you handle ARPs? So uh, the controller handles most of the ARPs. Okay. I mean, 
Uh, you can think of it as the, the router is a, a, a route proxy, an art proxy agent. Okay. But that's a short story. Are, are um, you maintaining you know, the notion of a VLAN or subnet for sanity? Because with this model, you could. So, really what's actually it, cool you know? about this model is we are completely decoupled from what the actual underlying implementation is. So, depending on what the hardware is capable of, we do a VLAN, which is what we're probably doing here. Well, that's what we're doing here. Um, you know, as your hardware becomes VXLAN capable, we can use VXLAN isolation. Um, you know, it's actually kind of cool. These cheap low-end boxes are capable of doing MPLS tagging. You know, we have machinations of doing MPLS. It's, it's actually, you know, uh, I don't know if people have seen uh, Scott Schenker's talk to the effect of, you know, networking needs abstractions. <coughs> Why do you care what your isolation primitive is? You don't. You just need it to be isolated. And the fact that you feel like you have to care, I, I think, is actually, you know, a mistake in our industry. And you know, obviously you have to do it for service you know, integration between the outside of the box, you know, uh, from the fabric to, for example, the load balancer. Right. You, know, you have to know what to program the load balancer to do. Right. But inside the fabric, you really shouldn't have to care. You just have to have a common primitive. You just have to have, and you can think of it as you know, inside the box, inside the logical box, you can do whatever you want, and then you have a translation layer. My question was more around, in theory, you could just do a large segment, right? Since you're using flow space, you can just isolate it without even VLANs if you, if you wanted to. Yes, absolutely. But, but it sounds like you are maintaining the VLAN so, construct. Um, it, it actually, and this gets back to a question that Ivan asked earlier. The VLANs are useful for overlapping addresses, both Macs and, um, and IPs. And, and you know, for some customers, but not all, and actually you know, very practically, it ends up being a lot of the distinction for us between a service provider and an enterprise. You know, enterprises don't care. They can control in a lot of cases. And, you know, uh, the other thing that gets interesting is as enterprises get larger, they start to look more and more like service providers. So uh, you know, that's certainly a first class feature for us is, is to support duplicate uh, addresses. And would you stand on this as OpenStack and cloud and ape cloud fabrics? Would you ever see an enterprise not deploying a cloud, deploy the solution? So if you look at the economics, if you're going to, there's a, a clear break point of if you're going to have utilization above a certain threshold, it's better to do it internally. And uh, I, I, let me repeat your question and make sure I heard you right. Apologies for the fan. Um, you know, so your question was... I'm saying if it's enterprise not deploying a cloud, no self-service, just, hey, they have a you know, leaf spine today, no integration to OpenStack or any platform for that matter, CMS system, you know, would you want to deploy, you know, this cloud platform in a non-cloud environment, if you Oh, will? absolutely. You know, so uh, talking to the HPC community, talking to some of the scientific computing community, uh, they have lots of interest in this that has nothing to do with VMs. Uh, other questions? So uh, what I'm going to do here, so, okay, uh, let me make sure that I don't get ahead of myself. Everything you've seen so far is pure OpenStack unmodified, uh, except for the router being everywhere. That there's no special sauce from Big Switch. So what I'm going to do here is grab one of the web VMs and actually log into it. And I will scroll up so people can see. But I'm going to do the obvious thing which is start a ping. So remember our security policy was the web is not allowed to talk to the database, the tier. That's the, the policy we wanted to enforce. Right now it's actually, you know, web is clearly talking to DB. This is a bad thing. How do we fix this? So what we've added at Big Switch, and you know, you'll see the GUI, but you know, really the, the interesting bits are on the back end. Um, really? If I go to the router that we defined, and I'll pull up this special tab, we actually end up in this very clear, easy to understand matrix of can tier X talk to tier Y? That's good. And uh -huh. if I take the web tier and uncheck the one for the database tier, and then I go back over to the, the tab, we see the ping has stopped. Oh, cool. so, uh, if you think, of, okay, what would it take you to do that in your network? So you'd have to configure an ACL uh, between probably the physical router. So that means you're doing some amount of you know, trombone routing up to go to a physical, to do this to a single point. Or if you had you know, better routing where you're actually trying to do shortest path between things, 
Uh, it just gets to be a mess. Like, I, I don't even want to sit here and explain it. So that's, that would stun the flow on the fabric then, so it can't layer two, or, you know, between the machines then. Uh, sorry, say again? That would sort of stun the flow, so it would stop yes. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so this, this was a live flow yeah. that, that, you know, on the back end what happened here was the controller inserted original flow for that, saw that there was a policy change, recomputed it, checked against existing flows, and yanked the, that flow. So it's, right. Actually yeah. replaced it with a drop hole. That's four so even changes. If it was an actual, like, yeah. like, a, okay. like a TCP flow that was in flight, yeah. it would still stop, because yeah. ICMP's kind of... Yes, yes. I, 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 flows per. I, I, I could run the iperf for you guys to convince you, but I don't no, want to no, deviate no, for no, the yeah, demo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just checking whether it was yeah. all new flows or if it would immediately affect existing it's a, it's, flows. It's, it's, uh, immediately affects existing flows, for, for some definition of immediate. But, you know. Are you changing it in the vSwitch only, or again, every hop, is there a so, change? Uh, what's, uh, so we only actually have to do it at a single point during the hop, because I, what, what I said is we yank the flow, and that's actually not true. We, we insert a drop flow. And so you, you only need to drop it at a certain point. In the, right now, it is in the ingress vSwitch. And if you see traffic in, in you know, the other way, we'll insert it at the egress one. So we'll block it anywhere that we see traffic. Right. OK. Um, you know, for pedantic's sake, just to prove to you guys that it's, it's actually real, uh, I'll, I'll re-enable it. Very impressive. Um, and I believe most of the delay here is actually in OpenStack. Yeah. Do, so, you, do yeah. you have some sort of way to, I noticed that you automatically created that rule table, but that's because you made the initial connections, is that right? Or is there a way to look at everything? Let's say you have a fabric that's talking openly. Can you get an idea of viewing what's communicating? Then you assign rules to that. So um, this rule table is dynamically generated based off the router interfaces. So okay. um, you know, if you had a fourth network with a, a fourth interface to it, you know, that rule table would pick up an extra row and column. So it was automatic. I might have missed a step. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what if you have a real network with like hundreds of interfaces. Oh, and you know what? Uh, this is the critical thing that I didn't mention. This is a single tenants view. So, you know, I imagine, you know, I'm deploying a web app. I would actually get this account and I would get this view, which is totally independent of you with your web app with your view. And so, yes, obviously a real network is going to have hundreds of hundreds of routers with, with many more interfaces. But, you know, on an application by application basis, you only have to consider any one, you know, one set of them. I still might have multiple interfaces. I mean, all your examples are one and one, you know. Your data path was one MAC address. Uh, no, so the data path is actually multiple MAC addresses. I can log into another. So I have multiple VMs for, for the web servers. I mean, maybe I'm not understanding your question. She's, she's I mean, saying I, for, for, for much larger networks, right, you're going to have a very large. I mean, so for your number. examples, like two nodes, and that's all fine. But I'm, I'm more mic how do I scale it? So what about this do you think inherently doesn't scale? You know, the GUI, but you know, <laughs> e even that's kind of fine. Yeah, 100, 100 nodes in every tier would look pretty much the same, right? Would there be any difference? In this matrix, so your, your router map will be very difficult to see. I bet. No, but that, that's no, so. Per tier. This is not per. I'm, yeah. I'm still, I mean. No, but, I mean, so, okay, take you know, the biggest customer that we work with has about 1,000 applications, right? And so each application has three or four different tiers. <laughs> So they would have a thousand different tabs like this, but each tab would legitimately look like this. And each yes, application owner can each manage. application would look like this. Right. And you know, yes, they would have more than two VMs in a tab. They might have ten. They might have twenty, depending on the application. But it's not so incomprehensible to think that this, if it works for two, it works for twenty. And you abstract these away too, exactly. to a certain degree. Yeah. You can take m by number of. Yep. Machines are running in the backside, or m by yeah. m, m by number. I mean, of low at a certain point, we're, we, what we're limited by is the rack that we walked in by, yeah. in with. The, I mean, the scale, the configuration scalability in this case is OpenStack. So the configuration here is that there's a big switch plug-in inside of the OpenStack orchestration system, and configuring thousands or tens of thousands of servers in OpenStack is solved in different ways. You cut, okay. you well, I, I just want the servers talking to users, so maybe I have an enterprise view or something, so it's not just a couple of WAN circuits go into a cloud. Um, the, the scalability limits are the interface, how you reach it, and that's generally solved somewhere else. So the network configuration is now bound to the OpenStack or the VMware. So that would be open flow with my partner ecosystem? Sorry? <laughs> um, I, I didn't even hear it. So. Yeah. Uh, so um, that 
the, the scalability issue is the physical switches themselves, how many entries, how many flow entries you can get into a switch. Mm -hmm. And that today, that's something that's being solved over time as new hardware comes to the marketplace, right? And, so, and you know, better use of existing hardware. Yeah, or better use of existing hardware. And this is where Switch Lite comes in. There's existing hardware, there's three points inside the switch where you can load open flow entries. If you can optimize for those three different tables, you can get many more than the limits of just using TCAM. And, so yeah. the scalability problem today is the size of the flow table in the network. There's ways to solve for that, although they're hard, right? Which is why Big Switch is taking this on because that's a challenge they're up for. But configuration-wise or managing this scalability is determined by your operational platform, your orchestration platform, which is your OpenStack or your whatever it is you're using for service or server orchestration because the network configurations comes from there, not from... Maybe it's worth noting that you're much like our CLI and you know, the, 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 the GUI that I'm showing you is OpenStack, not ours. Um, everything here is scriptable, right? You know, this is just an interface in the front end. And so if you wanted to spin up a thousand of these and could write the for each script to do it, then that's a manageable thing to do. Now, to, to, to Greg's point, yes, I mean, you eventually will hit a scalability limit and fundamental in these chips, but it's not at the thousands level, it's the tens of thousands. Uh, tens, of, you know, thousands uh, tens of thousands of applications, not even hosts, right? You can get you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, on the order of 100,000 uh, hosts going in here. So the limitation on the orchestration side, since OpenStack doesn't have any v6 support, you guys can't abstract and present any v6 components so, within the big switch side for these. Yes, and, and so these. what we're actually doing, and it's an important thing that I should have said, uh, we're demoing with OpenStack. That's something that people kind of know and, and like. Uh, we are not at all coupled to OpenStack, and in no, fact, we no, have I'm our aware, own APIs. And I'm so, aware of that. So, in terms of handling v6, though, for those that are doing dual stack overlays and things, like, it's not an issue in terms of how you manage that process? No, I mean, so uh, V6 support is completely independent of this. I mean, to, to all cards on the table, it's something we're working on, but you know, it's, it's yep. nothing in this workflow would change except for the IP addresses, the ranges that you allocate. Okay, so there's some prefix stuff in neighbor discovery that's a yeah. little, completely different, right? And that- Well, I mean, you know, you know, when I said, you know, except for some you know, IP addresses that you allocate, you know, that's a huge thing. Right. But you know, that, that, that is- Multicast is a much bigger, deal in v6 than it is in v4 yeah. today, right? So well, there's, I mean, there's so some scaling limitation problems that you run into. Yeah, in implicit in what it means here is this is a broadcast domain. So if something broadcasts here, it doesn't reach here. And Correct. then once you score to multicast, the question is, you know, does this logical router support like IP multicast? Right, but there's a whole construct that goes in with v6. You have multiple addresses on a, v on a, on a v6 per interface, right? So yeah. you start dealing with a lot more associations. You have zone IDs that you have to match up. You have there's, there's different forwarding and prefix policy table. And I mean, effectively that host. cuts into what Greg was getting at. You know, each one of those entries consumes another entry in the right. table. And, you know, uh, and this is not news to any of you that you know, IPv6 you know, requires a lot more hardware. So you know, very practically, you know, an entry one for one takes up more space in these tables. And the fact that you're right, you need multiple entries for a given device that just consumes more things. And multiple multicast entries yes. per interface yeah. per yeah. And, and so. Space, so. But that's a problem we've got with existing. Net. That's not new. That, that's not new. That's not new. No, that's an existing problem that we've got. Yeah. You can and only have the half point. the number of IPv6 routes that you can. As it gets better for other people, we can leverage that because the limit's fundamentally the hardware that we're all using. That's right. Yeah. So whether you architect your cams for. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. So <coughs> maybe I'm looking at this wrong, but when I see a web tier in my head, I see that as like an object. Group. Yes. So and. I can see in the table how you can click and between those two groups, no connectivity, no flows. What about exceptions? Uh, how do you mean exceptions? Well, so you uh, no flows except for port 22? Something like that. <coughs> I showed you the, the happy GUI demo version of this. Yeah. Uh, for this version, and in fact, you know, a lot of the things here were limited by what the OpenStack GUI will let us do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, down into the CLI, which I'll show you in the next step, mm -hmm. you can actually say you know, exactly, um, you, you can specify things that look a lot like an ACL, okay. which is you know, things between these two ports, or these two tiers are only allowed if it's on port 80, if it's on 22. Um, a critical limitation of the hardware we're using is it has to be stateless. And if you want to do a stateful thing, what you actually would do is insert a firewall. So I say, 
and, and this is actually the ex nice segue, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> the, the next part of the demo, which is to say, A can only talk to B if it goes via C. Okay. And, and so uh, for this purpose, the, the C is going to be the load balancer. Um, let me pop this up. All right, so um, one caveat about this next part, you know, so we talked about BVS is, is you know, really in, in beta now. We're, we're, we're working on this. We're, we're leaning forward a bit by showing you guys. We're, we're hoping that this is the, uh, the right level of detail for you. We don't have a fancy GUI for this. Uh, we're you know, we're going to drop down to the CLI. Hopefully, you guys will follow us with, there, uh, with that. Um, we are working on the fancy CLI. I can point you to some of our OpenStack work. Uh, but the, the limitation is actually, because we're doing it in public, because we're doing an open source project, everything takes a little bit longer and you have to kind of negotiate with everything. So I'm going to show you the CLI version of this. Note that really the OpenStack GUI is just uh, a REST API call source. And so it's, all, all the important underpinnings are still the same. Okay. Um, just a question now that you mentioned the stateful and all that stuff. So since you're controlling the virtual and the physical switches, you could actually do most of the heavy lifting in the virtual switches. In fact, do. OK. Then um, it just might work, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and th this is what kills me. You know, the, the physical switches are actually incredibly capable. So uh, I, I heard the, the quote of, there are three tables. No, there are literally hundreds of tables mm. that all have crazy special purposes. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I, I started joking about a, a table a day you know, uh, talking about, you know, through, through the companies trying to socialize, you know, this day we're going to talk about this table. There's a lot of capabilities in these, the hardware devices. Uh, I understand that people are skeptical about this and until they see the proof, um, I, I understand. Uh, at the same time, you know, if you want to get under NDA with Broadcom, we can have some great conversations. Or, or you know, Intel or, or whomever, right? Okay. So. Yeah, and one of the curiosities uh, out of this is that you guys could actually, because you have that sort of view, you could actually optimize the table sets on the fly based off of what you're seeing on performance parameters, which is far more interesting on a tuning basis. Because if you decide to introduce V6 on your net, you can actually see what operational impacts you're having to determine sizing guidelines. It's sort of a reverse of what you would traditionally do, because normally you have to calculate that in advance. And normally I'm going through and digging through all of that on the Mm -hmm. Service router networks and trying to find out. Yeah, I think and, and this is the value of the switch lot operating system. Right, and so you could it, actually reverse it. You could actually do a sample overlay and, and actually start taking a look at what imp operational impacts it's having on a net and yeah. sort of scale that up. I get, yeah, I think if I understand you correctly, yes, I think so. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to log into our controller and I'm going to show you the under the cover of the bits um, once the network pops up. This. We brought uh, our own wireless networks. We get a nice isolated environment. Definitely a mistake. <laughs> All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you the running config specific for that tenant. And so note, if I type show running config tenant and hit tab, it shows me a bunch of different tenants. Um, all of these are for the other demo. This long garbly gook is the UUID for the tenant that comes out of OpenStack. Uh, future versions will show nicer things, blah, 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 blah. So if we walk through this, um, and in fact, you know, I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint uh, that has this highlighted in nice, pretty ways. Um, uh, maybe you guys can't see this either, but it doesn't matter. So th there's a, a uh, it does matter. There's a stanza here for each tier. And then there's uh, an, um, an instance for the router. And then there's an insert for each router interface. And so note, you know, this is the, the logical IP address for that router is 13111 slash 24. Uh, and we've got similar ones for, for, for each network. And so um, what we're going to do, and by we I mean John in the background, um, is we're going to type a bunch of CLI commands where um, my app is the UUID that we get out of uh, we get out of OpenStack, and we say we're going to route for this tenant from the web app to in the same tenant the BVS tier only if it goes through this IP address. And so that is all other traffic between these two tiers is disallowed. The only way to get to these two things is by using this uh, is by going to this as a next hop. 
And so this is a virtual IP on the F5. And so this could just as easily be a firewall. It could be just as easily a NAT or an intrusion detection system or something like that, a pass-through intrusion detection system. And so jumping back. So just thinking out loud, I guess, if you're going through a firewall load balancer, if NAT is being performed, you have to be aware of that to be able to modify flows on the opposite side if of If it's that going device. to modify the packet. OK. Um, it, it, you know, load balancers have a litany of different settings that some do modify the packet and some don't. Uh, firewalls typically drop the packet or, or not. You know, a NAT obviously is going to modify the packet. Unless the, they do NAT. Right, so, right. And so, and yeah. <laughs> Stateful, um, stateless. It, it's something that you'll have to do. And you know, honestly, uh, I hope you guys believe me that this is much better than things were. <laughs> um, it doesn't solve all the problems. You know, we've still got some things to do. It's <laughs> not, not, not a problem. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, the, the big thing actually is that you still have to manually configure that box, right? And, and you know, make sure that these configurations are synced. This is really the point that you're getting at. Um, and as we start to work more, and, and Open Stack ends up being a great community to do this, to have the, the pluggable API of you know, spin up a VIP, use this list of IPs as the IP pool, um, and we'll make sure that traffic shows up to you on this form. Then we actually can even start to automate some of those bits as well. So uh, what I'm going to do is log into uh, a machine that's on the outside world. I'm sure that Jason has opened up all these windows for me in another window, but I can't find them now. So you guys have to suffer through me trying to type my password again <laughs> um, and the latency on the network. All right. And so I'm going to call wget on, what was that IP? on the external VIP a couple times and show you that, yes, in fact, this is being correctly load balanced. And so um, the policy is that you can only get to these things if it goes through this IP. And so that, that's actually really nice. Um, the last thing, I'm realizing that we're starting to run out of time. Um, let me jump quickly to this. Um, we actually collect in the controller an inventory of all of the, the Macs that we've learned in the network. This looks like garbage because I've you know, made things bigger. Um, but you know, we have this awesome command, trace packet in, where I can say, tell me what, a pack, you know, what happens to a packet if it comes from, for example, uh, app, the, the app VM number two. You know, the packet is an, an IP packet and is going to, for example, database number one. What happens when we do this is actually splits out all kinds of information, including uh, the path. So we can say, the first thing this did was hit uh, the, the, the switch light instance um, on this compute node. It went up to the spine, and it went down to another leaf, and then it went to another switch light instance. And you can actually see the explicit path here. Additionally. You can see as I scroll up, um, you know, it tells you which exact policy rule this packet hit. So it says the reason why I did this thing is because it hit this, this rule. So can you do predictive policy changes and then diff the two? That was the demo that we almost did. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's, you know, uh, and, you know, the, we can do that and we can do also um, Show me all of the ch all of the changes that would happen based on this stiff. Okay. And so, so from a change control management basis, yeah, you have predictive. You want to roll back. You have an understanding of what happens on your yes good path. Good path. Um, you know, the, a really subtle one is this packet's going to do the same thing it did, but for a completely different reason. That's really what gets you. You know, six months from now of okay, well I removed this rule that I didn't think did anything and everything breaks. No. Uh, I, I started joking, you know, obviously what we're selling here is you know, uh, deployment automation, uh, all, all this automation for rollout. I actually really think there's a huge area in SDN in terms of debugging automation. Right? Things that you, maybe we control your network, maybe we don't, but we can help you better interrogate your network for what it's doing. I, I think there's a, a huge space there that, that you know, we're just starting to tap.
So um, we're, we're running a little late on time, so I will probably end the demo here. Um, let me try to, A, turn off these boxes. Thank you guys so much for suffering through the heat. <laughs> Actually, when you guys grab and turn this off so we don't have to shout as much. Um, I mean, I just wanted to, to wrap up. You know, so uh, just to, to recap of what we told you guys, you know, we showed you our switch light stuff. So this is the, the basis of a lot of what we're doing. It's not inherent, but it's actually really powerful, and it's actually letting us move faster. A lot of these BVS features uh, depend on switch light. Uh, we showed you our tapping solution, the, uh, the monitoring fabric, Big Tap. Uh, we're actually getting great customer traction with that. Uh, we're very happy with that. That's a full GA product. And you can kind of see why. You know, it sits off on the side. It's fairly simple in terms of what it does, but it's actually it's really solving real people problems. Um, and you can see kind of the, the, the different tack we've taken with our, our cloud fabric, the, the BVS product. That, you know, we, we are moving away from overlays. Uh, it's not a permanent thing. You know, I actually think that long term that you know, the, the, the overlay camp and the non-overlay camp will eventually converge on a, a hybrid network, just as a question of what do you hit first. Mm. Um, you know, particularly as overlay-based hardware starts to become more available. Um, and I, I think that you know, we'll, we'll see. But the, the short term is you know, all networks are different. Not all the same solutions apply to the same networks. Uh, you guys probably know this even better than I do. Uh, and I think there's definitely room and interest for both. So uh, not that you guys haven't been asking questions, but you know, if you've got any more, we've got was another 10 minutes yeah, or so. So to summarize, you effectively, because you know, a year ago you were all about partners and switch vendors and so on. So now you decided to just drop that story and you're going with your own, in double quotes, hardware. I, I wouldn't say drop the story. Um, you know, uh, folks, feel free to jump in here. But you know, we, we are selling Big Tap with partners. Right? There are a bunch of partners. We have a hardware compatibility list. Um, Is any of the big, big vendors on that list? As of today? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for example, you can deploy Dell with a, a you know, Dell switch with Big Tap today. OK. That works. I mean, let me briefly comment there, right? Um, we did, made a big change there. I mean, for me, the big change is to move away from um, SDA implement, SDN implementations that are implemented by the switch vendors towards bare metal switches, right? That's, that's definitely a trend we're seeing. I think that's a trend that's going to continue, right? Um, to me, that's different from partner versus non-partner, because we are seeing interest from actually switch manufacturers to say, you know, can we sell switches without hardware, right? For the server guys, it seems to work. Why doesn't that work for the networking guys? And, and you know, I'm actually a big believer that, so if you, know, if you look at, for servers, this hardware software separation has happened for a long time, and today, pretty much everybody buys branded servers, right? You know, Google is different, but you know, most people buy Dells or HPs or, or IBMs. I think the same thing will happen with switches, but will still be branded switches. They'll just be, be bare metal switches that you can put any software on them that you but want. How are you going to sell that idea to the average enterprise, let's say, that's been buying Cisco or Juniper switches, branded gear for yeah. so long? There's a, there's a mindshare problem that you guys are going to fight. So it's actually interesting, right? Specifically for Big Tap. Um, the conversations, like, you know, going back a year ago or two years ago, right, the conversations with customers typically around SDN. They're like, wow, SDN is cool. You know, tell us something. But it's like, hey, we have an SDN solution. Big tap today, typically the conversations are with, with monitoring teams. They want to solve a simple problem. The question is, you know, what's the relative cost in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of OPEX? What is the flexibility, you know, that we can give them in terms of, you know, uh, working with multiple teams, overlapping policies, uh, you know, and, and sort of, uh, in some cases, self-service, actually. So, you know, self-service tapping. So I can, I can, if I have an app running, I can tap it myself. <laughs> Those cases, the question of what hardware is this comes relatively late. In, in the cycle, right? I mean, they, they're asking, and you're saying, like, look, we'll tell you what switches to buy, works well, software, but the whole solution runs. And they're like, okay, that's fine with me. That's an application specific thing. You're talking about a sea change where network switches that are, is an operating system running on a bare metal switch is an idea the vast majority of uh, folks out there aren't even thinking about. So, you know, I think. 18 months ago, I would have completely agreed, right? And 18 months ago, we have had, we didn't hear from a single enterprise customer about bare metal switches. I think that's a safe statement, right? Uh, that has completely changed since, right? I mean, today, you know, when I'm in New York and talk to large banks, they all have bare metal switch, you know, pilots or, or, or trials going off of some way, shape, or form, right? Um, you know, we're seeing it in service providers, we're seeing it in carrier networks, um, you know. In terms of you know market share, it's still tiny. Right? I mean, outside hyperscale, right? I, mean, I think we all know, right? Yeah. The, you know, yes. the, the, the Googles and Amazons of the world—they're doing all kinds of things. They've done it for a long time. But um, you know, if, if you go to the, the the more classic enterprise or classic service providers, um, they're all trying it out at this point. And 
we haven't faced a lot of pushback there in terms of adopting that. I mean, they're, they're looking to deploy this, you know, whether it's a cloud fabric or, or, or tab fabric for one specific use case, and they're putting in place new network equipment for that anyways. You know, and, and they're, they're open to new vendors. Guido, are those same enterprises, are they uh, white box x86? That's, uh, Mostly no. I yeah, mean, it's, see, so that's weird that it's, because uh, I figured it would just trend so, with, can you use white box x86 I think it, today? Absolutely, right? Yeah, that's bizarre. I, I mean, and that's, I think, why we're saying bare metal, not white box, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. if uh, you know, in the future, if Dell sells a bare metal switch, and somebody already has Dell service, you know, who's he going to buy? I think, you know, I, I could definitely yeah. see them having a business there. Yes, it seems like the trends, too, is where I'm from, back in Manhattan, New York City, anybody testing OpenStack is using that as an avenue to test newer players for network. Yeah. And uh, it is what it is, but it yeah. could be a new hardware vendor, new software vendor, and SDN, but it seems like a lot of the POCs are going on via OpenStack. Yeah. The other thing to think of, and this is getting a little away from just Big Switch, but Keep in mind that we now have different, up until now our networks have been homogenous. We've used the same switches for the campus as we do for the data center, as we do for remote offices. Everything's been the same. There's no reason why we can't have in the data center, there's a network which we use for the virtualization clusters and it's got a particular type of switching architecture which is radically different from the switching architecture that supports the legacy area of the network. So there's no reason why you can't have Agreed. You know, a standard chassis running spanning tree over here with VLANs and you've got some layer three and some, you know, you've got a whatever, but over here is your OpenStack cluster and it's running a, you know, that yeah. it's got a specific set of optimized hardware just for that. In the same way that blade servers are optimized for, you know, virtualization, we can have optimized for virtualization switches and you'll still have all the other stuff. This is why my yeah, motto is uh, always- Yeah, I would agree. I think OpenStack is an avenue to test new network gear and as well as get away from <laughs> VMware on the hypervisor side, right? A lot of these same customers are going to KVM, reduce costs there, and try out new SDN players. Mm -hmm. But I can't, I can't argue that. I agree Jason, 100%. if Dell is smart, they'll start shipping this as V-blocks. Well, D-blocks. Right. So it's also worth- Dell, Dell switches, Dell servers, this controller pre-packaged, you know, Nicely packed with OpenStack on it. We're getting Here you have OpenStack one instance. Get Nutanix Converge <laughs> player, ship it, and uh, it, be done. It's also right. worth noting that you know it's it's not really a, a huge motivator for people, but the the reduction in capex cost makes it very easy to try. You know that uh, you know the you you know it's great. I sent out this email in terms of the company. If you do Google searches for you know Quanta LB2, uh, LY2, you can get five different vendors that will give you a quote that you can put it in your shopping cart and have it in your office in two days. Right, you know, that, that's a big thing. Yeah. With a and credit you know, card. With a credit card. Yeah, yeah. It's it's sub $5,000. Yeah. Right? You don't actually have to, and, and so you can try these things. This is where NSX is going to get ground because it's got it's just software, it works on your existing, so people will go and play with it in the back corner and then it'll suddenly have, it'll do a SharePoint, you know. Yeah. It'll creep its way out into the network. That's part of why we brought the rack in, not just to cook you guys, but also to uh, you know <laughs> get, get, give you a feel for what this stuff actually looks like. Yeah. And you know what? It looks like the same gear you're buying anyways. Yeah. And the, the reality is there's some service providers doing this today. Uh, absolutely. You know, DreamHost has got a good chunk of this. Well, you know, Google's obviously very loud about this. Facebook has their open compute movement. You know, there, There's a lot of people who have basically figured out that this is the way to go, and it's a question of... I don't think it's a question of if, it's more of a question of when the rest of the world follows. And certainly what we're seeing is that there, you know, if you look at, you know, adoption, you'll know, say, you know, the Googles and the Facebook of the world are like 0.1%. I, I think in the next, in the last year, we've seen, you know, the next 5% start to jump on this. And the question is, when is the, the next wave well, going to happen? They invested the human capital to make this innovation work to a And continue degree. to. And they continue to. And so that's the reality is, is that once that goes to market, everyone else is able to then, they can't invest the same human capital yeah. investment to, to make yeah. this stuff. Well, I would argue the next 5% of people <coughs> who are trying everything, just in case it works and their competitor already knows how to use that. Hmm. That may well be the case. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, it's a lot of, 5% uh, you know, is a number I came up with off the top of my head. I, I think yeah. you know, there are companies that are much more conservative, at least in my mind, who are still trying this. Yeah, because it just might work with their competitor. So they have to be prepared. If this actually works, they better know what's going on so they can deploy quickly. Otherwise, they're three years behind. Yeah. 
I think it's also, you know, as, as these technologies mature, it becomes lower and lower risk, right? You know, trying out Big Tap, you know, it's like, okay, you buy, buy a couple of white box switches. They're not very expensive. You know, get a demo license from us. It's, yeah. you know, it's, you can try that out. If it works, you scale it a little bigger. I mean, you know, most of the deployments we've seen, they start small, uh, you know, and then, then there's a scale out over time. Yeah, well, Big Tap is a no-brainer. If you have an extra port on the Gigamon tap, you plug this in and you try exactly. it out. Yeah. Or, so yeah, go on. Yeah. It's, it's the transition. You know, I, I'm still remembering back in the mid-90s when we started to see the transition from hubs to switches. And then it was ATM and then it was FIDI and then we had these. It's just technology transitions. There's going to be a lot of change going on in the next five years. Don't get bent out of shape about any particular. You know, today it's tunnels, tomorrow it'll be native. Then there'll be a hybrid, like you said. It'll be both. Some will be tunneled and some of it will be native and, you know, we'll converge on what we all like eventually. So. Oh, the question is really, can you establish virtual circuits across the physical network? Yeah. And what tagging do you have, do you need for that? Yeah. Because tunnels are virtual circuits. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, and then it, it, it's just a question whether you have one controller for the fabric and the other one for the edges or you have one controller for both. Who cares? No. I don't care. Yeah. And also, you know, how much additional scalability do you get out of those tunnels, actually? Yeah, I mean, you could use VLAN tags for tunnels. You could use MPLS tags for tunnels. You could use IP addresses for tunnels. Yeah. We just use IP addresses because everyone supports them. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's right, right? Do you, do you do it one stack deep, other stack deep? Do you put an address label or not? But yeah. And I think our approach is to say, look, at the end of the day, from a customer's point of view, they don't care so much what's under the hood, right? They care about what's, you know, for them, well, Sorry for the pun again, but everything is a big switch, right? They, they really care about the, the, the edge and, and how you manage the edge, and, and we take care of how you forward things. Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, we are not there yet. I, I don't think we'll ever be there, because with your car, you don't care what's under the hood. If it breaks down, you call the service, they tow it away, and someone fixes it. Yeah. That doesn't work with your network. That, that's true. You know, at, at the same time, I think you know, as price points go down, I think we're going to see a lot more redundant architectures. It's, it's sort of, I think it's instructional to look again at the hyperscale. How do they run their networks? Right? The, hey, a, a core switch failed today. I have to replace it this month model. Right? You know, where, where everything, where everything Hardware goes. failure is one thing. Hitting a bug is another. Well, that is true. So and the, if you hit a bug in the controller, whoops. The, the thing I always tell people is, when's the last time you debugged your hypervisor? Your hypervisor. Right, so the hypervisor is a big black box that everybody's kind of known to grow and love that's totally undebuggable for mere mortals. So actually, I unfortunately asked this on our engineering team. We have a bunch of VMware people, and you know, they all raised their hands. It's a black <laughs> box that you've grown to know and trust because it doesn't blow up on you. And you know what? The, black box, the, the network is a black box that blows up on us regularly. And you know, we just have to you know, A, get the tools, the insight, the hooks that we've been talking about to build that trust. But eventually, you know, we, the network will... How many people believe that the network will be manageable by humans without automation in 20 years? In 10? In 5? Right? You know, there's a sliding scale of this, but you know. You see, what, what I hate about everyone comparing servers and hypervisors to network, and we all know that and we pretend that that's not true, servers are not coupled. Yeah. Servers are individual instances. Well, what you could say applications are coupled. Yeah, well, yeah, but uh, he was talking about hypervisor. I mean, no. this hypervisor has nothing to do with the next hypervisor. Has nothing to do with the next hypervisor. A network, unfortunately, is not. No, but the application that's running on all of them, if it causes a crash, will cause it to crash on all of them. They, they are coupled. If the application crashes the well, yeah, but that's, that's the that BPDU guard problem Kurt was having. If other apps on the same hypervisor, takes down the other apps as yeah. well, right? I mean, there's coupling here. Yep. It's, it may be a little more, a little less coupling. I think it's, it's fundamentally the same thing. So I wanted to ask, or take the conversation a slightly different direction. You touched on virtual switching. <laughs> so you're, in this demo, you're yep. using the virtual switch. Um, are you built, and you're using Switch Lite as a virtual switching yeah. system for this OpenStack demonstration yeah. here. Right. So the same operating system that runs on the hardware is also being used as a virtual switch. Yeah. In this. What about kernel? It's the same is, code, yeah. Yeah, it's the same so code. So for the, the kernel, for the, kernel the operating system, for, yeah. for the vSwitch, right, I mean, you're running, for example, on KVM, which has Linux underneath. So we don't have our own Linux or something like that. We just sit on the guest Linux, right? We basically just have a, um, you know, the uh, uh, hypervisor switch as a, as a standalone thing, right? Yeah. If, if it's for Broadcom, we have to create a complete firmware image, right? Because so. most people don't have a Linux already running on the switch <laughs> and can just, you know, do, do an apt-get, right? Well, well, for, yeah, for KVM, no, we can. But functionally, 
their switch light for same idea, same the, code. The yeah. same code. It's just packaged for the appropriate yeah. platform. So in the uh, when I'm on KVM, are you using the Open vSwitch kernel module? But yes. you've got your own I/O on the. Uh, app? Critically, we're using the one from kernel.org, not from openvswitch.org. Right. There is a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, depending on who you talk to, they're actually very sensitive to only accepting kernel modules blessed by kernel.org. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you have your own user space module. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I just want to make sure of that. So for now. VMware, have you got ways to get into the VMware, or is it only by as a guest VM and passing it through? So what's nice is you know, with the, uh, the VLAN integration that we have, and so take all, you know, swap OpenStack out of the picture, swap in vCloud Director, or um, why am I blanking on the name of this? The uh, VCAC. V virtual VCAC, uh, Yeah, thank you, mm. uh, vClient. Um, all we have to do is react to the events. You know, if you on a, um, on a vSwitch, deploy a new VLAN. We can react to that event and make sure the VLAN's trunked and all the broadcast groups are the right thing and, and all those things. Yeah. You know, we haven't written that code yet, but you know, it's at least architecturally possible. It, yeah, you, over yeah. time, you'll, yeah. you'll be able to reach out further towards the end. Yeah. And, so know, the, the same with other orchestration platforms. Yeah, but then you have the question whether people who are using VMware would be willing to go with uh, bare metal switches or whether those people who are willing to go with bare metal switches wouldn't at the same time also go with OpenStack. And, and that's why we're hitting OpenStack first. Yeah. yeah. I think look, yeah. There, there'll be some correlation But it's there. first, right? Yeah. It's not, you know. There's correlation, but we have no religion about that. Right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Hey, I just want to make sure that I understood that, because it's, it's not always as obvious when you start. Because the virtual switches, ultimately, there's a whole lot of functions you can add to that virtual switch, which adds value to the end-to-end -end system. We're sort of focusing on the hardware today, but I think it's worth, just in my mind, it, the, the whole thing's an end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. There's a virtual switch and there's a hardware switch and they're all part of your ecosystem. Yep. And that's, that's also important. I mean, there are absolutely things that we want to do that can only be done in the vSwitch and in a deployment like what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, where we don't have control of vSwitch, then we wouldn't be able to do those. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, here's another one. So we all know that OpenFlow 1.3 has its limitations. Yeah. And so Nicira was extending it in one direction, and you are extending it in the other direction, and uh, Contrail is doing third thing. Not entirely open flow based. Uh, but yeah, go I, on. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the point. So, uh, what us? happened to OpenFlow? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like any standard, right? I mean, uh, things well, evolve over time. Th th this sounds a lot like embrace and extend. <laughs> from so a certain company. If it's open, it's different. <laughs> I, mean, the, the, I think there's one, one critical piece here, which is uh, we do extend OpenFlow, right? Because the, the, the motivation is very simple. We want to innovate rapidly, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, sure. you know, here Broadcom comes out with a new chip, we're like, you know, super enthusiastic about it. Uh, us having to wait until, you know, a bit that makes them to the standard before we can use it just takes too long, right? So uh, what we're doing is, we, yes, we are, we're adding it, we're extending it. Um, but there's two things. First of all, we're then publishing that as open source, right? You can grab, you can grab the protocol drivers, you can see what we're doing, right? You know, at, at the from the GitHub site that he that he put up there earlier. Um, so, and we so we think this is important, right? Exactly for the reasons that you described. But the, the goal here is not to to create something proprietary, but basically to say, look, we can't always do standards because standards take time. Let's do open source instead. Right? Yeah. The second piece is, you know, we hope that we'll make it back to the standard eventually. Right? We are yeah. we're very well, active. A lot of my other Bob jobs. Very, very yeah. active in the, in the yeah. ONF. Well, I mean, I just don't see, outside of where hardware meets software, I just think it's totally unrealistic for anything other than whatever adopts, whoever wins to yeah, rough consensus open code. source implement. I, 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 absolutely. We'll, we'll see what happens. You know, software standards tend to not stick around. 